Okay, I got kind of a late start today, so I feel like I'm about ready to throw up at any time, so don't, don't be too worried. I'll try to throw up over in the corner, okay? I got something. Something's going on. Okay, let me ask a question. Have you gotten um, something about the teaching evaluations? Okay. And here's, a lot of times what we have trouble, I've noticed across a lot of the departments, is we have trouble with students filling them out, right? So would it be helpful if you had incentives to do that? Okay. So what I'm going to do on Tuesday, I'm going to, I can actually, you can do it through an app, can't you now? So what I'm going to ask you, if you, you can do it ahead of time, but if you come to class, we're going to have some time at the beginning of class where you can fill out some um, evaluations. I think you also, did you get a, a link to a Google form to do the lab instructor evaluations? Have you seen that? No, well, that was wrong. We shouldn't have done that. Now you should be getting, you'll be getting a link to a Google Forms to fill out because, anyway. So more evaluations. So, okay, hopefully by Tuesday you will have gotten that. And what we'll do is we'll spend about 10 or 15 minutes of the in a class on Tuesday to fill out those evaluations. And what I will do is, a professor, I get an, I get an idea of how many students have, have completed the regular evaluation of me, right, that you do through, what, do you do it through Webstar? I can't even remember. Webstar. Webstar, okay. So if we get to, say, 75% completion rate in the, depart in, the, in the class, I'll give you some bonus points. How's that sound? Is that incentive? Okay. So I'll send an email out about that. So, again, what's important is, you know, it's important that, you know, you evaluate me, the content of the course, and, you know, give, we, we need feedback to try to help the course and improve the course, or if, you know, you know, so, okay. Do you guys feel like you have enough material for this third exam after today's lecture, too? Or do you want more on Tuesday? That's what we're, yeah. So this is usually, at the end of this lecture, is the content I get through for the third exam. I have no idea if I went really fast or what happened, but something happened. And I could develop another lecture, that's not a problem. But I think it's probably plenty of material. So why don't, on Tuesday, and I'll send an email out, we'll do the, we'll probably do um, the review first, right? So the review is on Moodle, right? So I put the, uh, the question, you know, study guide is on Moodle. So we'll spend the first part of the class on Tuesday doing um, a review. And so you can ask questions and we can go through that sort of stuff. And then we'll, then we'll do the evaluations at the end. Okay, how's that sound? Okay, and the exam is a week from today. Okay. Okay. Um, anything else? Okay. So we've spent a lot of time looking at sort of competition, both intraspecific and interspecific competition and how predators can potentially regulate prey numbers and also how resources below prey may regulate prey numbers. And we're gonna, we're gonna focus today on sort of the next level above sort of interspecific interactions, whether it's predator and prey and competition between species, but looking at how um, community structure is determined. And we'll be looking at, you know, a lot of different things, but we're gonna focus on a couple things in terms of community structure. One is, what determines the number and diversity of species in a natural community? And we'll be showing you pictures of various things and how we look at what are called environmental gradients and how, you know, whether it's a salinity gradient, a temperature gradient, an elevation gradient as you go from, a, you know, basically a valley floor to the top of a mountain 10,000 feet. How do assemblages of plants and animal species change over that space and what influences that? And again, what we'll be focusing on is primarily how organisms respond to resources and nutrients, and then how higher level things such as predators and other competitors influence the number and diversity of species that we see. And so what we call this is community structure. And there's a lot more to this than, <laughs> this is, I could go on for a lot more than this, but. So if we look at these pictures, Let's just do a little exercise, not an exercise, but as you look at these, <laughs> a thought, a question. As you look at these pictures, what strikes you? Anything? 
Do you know where this is? You know what I did when I was in college? I used to drive cars from the Midwest all, the, all over the country, right, to deliver cars to people, right? And so I spent a lot of time hiking. You know, they'd give me like a week to drive a car from Chicago to San Francisco to the Bay Area. So I would spend a lot of time traveling all over the country and looking at things and spending time in parks. So this is the western United States, right? This is pro looks like kind of like Utah, right? Nevada, places like that, um, even parts of southern Colorado. But one of the things that I hope you see here is there's an incredible amount of diversity here. As you go from this stream to this, what's called riparian, you, can, you don't have to memorize all this. This is riparian habitat that's associated kind of, it's, it gets inundated with water every once in a while. But these trees along here are common here. And then as you go up this gradient along this rock face, you find a lots of different sort of plant and animal assemblages and communities, okay? So as you move from down here all the way up to here and even top, and if, you went, if there were big mountains here, you'd see this sort of replacement of species as you go from this gradient, from this sort of stream community up along these edges and onto these sorts of things. So the question, what we're gonna try to address is, what, causes, you know, what influences that? What determines what kind of species are there and those sorts of things, okay? Here's an area of California it, this is very common in the, sort of um, the foothills of the Sierra Nevadas, all those sorts of things. And what you'll notice here is what you see is, a, again, a lot of heterogeneity. And it's pretty abrupt, isn't it? What do you notice here? What's, what's, what strikes you about the differences in the sort of plant, at least the visible plant communities that you see as you go along here? Well, here's this sort of stuff, right? And that's mostly kind of grassland and stuff, you know, grasses and things like that. But then in these kind of swales in these lower areas, what do you find? Forests and trees and things like that. And these are particular kinds of oak, these are called oak chaparral forests. But there's a really abrupt transition between <laughs> that edge of that grassland to, the, they're literally right next to one another. So the question sort of is, what causes that sort of abrupt transition between these communities. And you can imagine, obviously, a lot of different, different grasses live here, large, larger trees live here, and there probably are lots of animals that are different that are associated with those sorts of plants, too, okay? And here's kind of an example. This is a pretty abrupt transition, too, right, between communities. Here's a stream community, right? Not too many move across that gradient into the terrestrial environment, but then you find often a lot of sort of plants that are specialized to live in sort of moister, wetter, more aquatic, these riparian habitats. But as you go up that gradient, what you'll see, there's a lot of trees. These tend to be a lot of shrubs as you go up that gradient, okay? So what do you think, if I were to ask you, what do you think is influencing the presence of these large trees, often called cottonwood trees? These are probably cottonwoods if it's the western United States, I'm not sure it is. And up into this gradient there as you move up, and those look like little small, low-lying shrubs. What do you think is the primary thing that's influencing that? What environmental feature? Do you have any idea? Thoughts or speculation? So you've got, you've, got a, you've got kind of a mountain face, right? And it's not flat. It's like this. What do you think's going on there? What's the key thing that's probably limiting an organism, the kinds of organisms that can live there? Yeah, A, it has to grow on a slant. But what do you also think about sort of water availability? Right, there's probably a lot, if it rains or something like that, or if it's snow, there's probably really rapid runoff of water. So these are probably, this is probably a much moister environment, right? And up in here, it tends to be much, you know, sort, you know, you do get rain every once in a while, and they have a lot of adaptations to catch that rain as quickly as possible, but it runs off really quickly, okay? So these are the sorts of things we, we, we often think about, and we look at all the various multitude of factors that can influence why these things are located here, why this different community is located there, and all those sorts of things. Okay. So I'm not going to spend too much. There was a lot of controversy in community ecology about how organisms. So this is often what we look at is the abundance of spe the number of individuals of a particular species along some environmental gradient, okay? So this could, this could be an elevation gradient, for example, right? Going from the valley floor 
over in here would be you know five thousand you know uh, three thousand meters high okay this could be a water gradient you know the availability of water it could be a salinity gradient in some sort of marine and estuary and system all sorts of lots of what we're really interested in what are called these environmental gradients some feature of the environment is changing <coughs> over space okay so a lot of people believe that closed communities were very common and the key feature and we'll show you some examples of this and you think back to that previous example the grasslands in that oak chaparral kind of in there that would be an example of kind of a closed community where there's a really abrupt transition between one community and the next one over space it's really there's like boom the grassland then you know in the next meter their forests okay so this is what's called, in this particular case, this is what's called an ecotone. And we'll show you examples. These are regions of rapid replacement of species along a gradient. So all this is saying here is how many species are in this, if this is low elevation, what, what we're saying is there are basically three species that occur in the lower elevation. And then there's some sort of abrupt transition. And you don't see these, the red, this reddish species in this part of the thing extending into the next part of the, this other ecotone. It's re, this tends to be replaced by four other species here. Some are of higher abundance here, higher abundance here, and those sorts of things. So, and then here's another ecotone, right, where these four species are now replaced by these three species, and another one here where those four are replaced by those three species, okay? These are what are called closed communities. And not and there are examples of that, right? And there are also examples of open communities. And basically, open communities, you don't find these abrupt transition between communities. And each one of these represents a species. Uh, this, is a, this is a species abundance curve. So here's the red one. It's most common in this area, but you do find it there. But it extends you know, further along that environmental gradient, although kind of at lower population density, right? So think about this abundance. This is the measure of population density. This is lower and this is higher, so the peak is here, the lowest is there. And then you, but what you find, you don't find a lot of these immediate replacements of each species at an ecotone. There's no such thing as an ecotone. And what we say, these species are kind of distributed independently with respect to one another in some way, right? So, and you find some, this one is really broadly distributed, right? Here's that species that's found for all the way from here to here, its peak is there, and some show a little, sh you know, less distribution, a smaller distribution along that gradient. But in general, you don't find these recognizable, you know, kind of these discrete communities, and they're more open. Okay. And uh, a lot of these ideas came out during the 1960s. That probably doesn't mean any, does that mean anything to you? <laughs> I'll leave it there. Okay. <laughs> I didn't grow up in the 60s. So I'm not that old, but okay. And the closed communities was kind of the traditional idea in ecology in the 40s and 50s, and then people kind of opened their minds up a little bit during the 60s and then developed some of these more open community ideas. And it was always presented it's either or, it's not really. Some communities are closed, some are open. It kind of depends, and we'll spend a little time on that. Okay. So what do you think that is? Is that an open community? Where is that? I'm not really sure. I think it's probably uh, like coastal Maine, Nova Scotia, up in the northeastern United States and uh, south, southeastern Canada. This is marine water, right? This is, the inter this is marine intertidal. So this is a marine intertidal community. Does it look like there are abrupt transitions between communities? Yeah. So obviously this is probably low tide, right? This picture was taken at low tide. At high tide, where do you think the water goes? Probably goes pretty much up, depends on how, what, and certain times of the year have higher, higher tides than others, but in general, it probably goes up into here, okay? So down in here, what you have is that's, there's a lot more time spent in submerged water and things like that. That's going to be like kelp and brown algae and sort of, you know, aquatic vegetation and things like that. What do you think's up in here? Remember the thing I talked about the last time? 
those barnacles and those sort of those marine invertebrates that attach themselves to rocks, whether they're barnacles, mussels, all these sorts of things. That, and some of them, and you'll find some of them are in there, but actually they tend to get crowded out by the plants and they often are restricted to this zone in here. And then you have a really abrupt transition to basically the, what are called boreal spruce forests on these islands. And you can see them over here too, it's the same pattern. You can see the aquatic vegetation here, and then it probably goes up into here, and there's a lot of rocks here. Nothing probably aquatic is living there, but some probably different kinds of plants. But then at the top are these sort of boreal forests that occur in these sort of northern environments, okay? So that's kind of an example of a pretty discrete closed community. As you go along this gradient from low tide to high tide, you see the replacement of communities along that gradient. Oh, we've seen that one, okay. So let me ask you a question. So what did we say was the main thing that influences the presence of Belanus, the larger barnacle, compared to Thamelus along that gradient? What was the thing that drove that? Do you remember that? Why is Belanus found in the lower and mid inner tidal? It outcompetes it, right? Okay. So it turns out, and how, how could you demonstrate, let me ask you, how, how could you demonstrate that? Or what's an alternative, let me ask you another thing. What's an alternative hypothesis for why this Thamelus species is not down in here that has nothing to do with competition? That's a tough one. One thing might be, Maybe it can't stand long periods of immersion in water, right? It doesn't like to be immersed in water that long. Maybe it doesn't have any, that it can't handle that long period of immersion. That, so that, that would be like an alternative hypothesis. The reason it doesn't live in here is it can't be underwater for too long. That's kind of stupid, but it probably isn't real, but it's an alternative hypothesis, right? It's, you know. So how would you test that? How would you test that the reason these aren't found here is because they can't spend those long periods of time down there and it doesn't have anything it that doesn't have anything to do with competition. What would be an experiment you could do? Yeah. yeah. And it turns out these things, these are the adult barnacles, and they produce when they mate, they actually fertilize their eggs externally and the larvae go into the water, right, and then they drop out and fall down to the rocks, and that's where they then begin their kind of adult phase, right? So they have a larval phase where they're in the water. When they're ready to become adults, there's a cue, and then they drop down here and attach and start growing this stuff. So a simple experiment would be remove all of these balanus, right? It's easy to do, and this is what the people did. Remove all those things down there, and let the thamelus settle there and remove all the balanus, right, so there's no competition. If the immersion hypothesis were true, what would the outcome be? What would happen to those things? They'd still be gone, right? They can't stand, so the idea would be if these things can't be immersed for that long period of time and you remove the competitor, then they shouldn't survive, right? So that would be the, that would be the outcome that would test that hypothesis. Guess what the answer was? They do great. They love it down there. So what do you think caused it? Balanus. Yeah, Balanus, the competitor. So the take home message is that Balanus was the better competitor. Thamelus does fine, immersed, grows, actually grows great in those environments because there's actually a lot more phytoplankton that they can suck out of the water, but they get out competed in those cases, okay? And then the other thing they found is what happened up here, right? Belanus actually, as larvae, settle up there. Guess what happens to them, though? They dry out and die, okay? And it's that thamelus that it can only spend long periods. It has, they have these physiological adaptations to prevent the drying out of tissues when they're exposed. And there were some time, there was one year where the water never reached this place for like a week. And all of the belanus died and only about 50% of the thamelus died. So that seems to be, so the idea here is this is a gradient, you have this assemblage, and these are kind of all considered the same communities, but you have this replacement of species along that gradient. Okay. 
here's another example. This is considered one of the most classic examples of sort of a closed community and the replacement of species in, in most cases along a gradient. Let me just show you the, the picture of it. This is what the community looks like, and this is primarily in, most of the study's been done in uh, the coastal range of California, um, where these, these are called the um, serpentine soils, and these are the non-serpentine soils over here. Does this look like a pretty abrupt transition between these two communities? So this is basically, here's low-lying grasses and weeds, weedy-like things, and here are the trees over here. So the question is, how are these, and these are all the species that are found, and I think this, this isn't all of them, but these are these serpentine um, communities in coastal California, and what you'll see here is, these are in the non-serpentine soils are the black oaks, poison oaks, iris, Douglas firs, those are the trees that you saw. They dominate and pretty much are only found in the non-serpentine soils. They kind of move into the ecotone a little bit, but they never get into the serpentine soils, okay? You have to, a few species that cut it, it seem to be unresponsive or tolerate any sort of soil, and it doesn't really matter. And these are pretty weedy things called hawkweed, fescue, and snake root. But see, they can, they can survive and live across the non-serpentine, the ecotone, the transition between that and the serpentine soils. Some are just exclusively found in the um, sort of ecotone. But then you have a series of others down in here. These, are the, these others grow only in serpentine soils, okay? So the question is, what's weird about, it's mostly serpentine soils, and I don't remember exactly what happened, but what, here's the level of the element in the soil across this gradient. So what's really weird in the serpentine soils? What particular elements are at really high concentration? You can see chromium is kind of what you, this level here in the non-serpentine, it goes up quite a bit in the ecotone, but it reaches really high levels in the sort of serpentine soils. Nickel is another, so the, the, the idea is the, two key, the three key elements that are really different between the non-serpentine soils and the serpentine soils are chromium, nickel, and magnesium. So you can see here they're at pretty high concentrations, but then you go into these other areas and they're very low concentrations, okay? So what would the hypothesis be about why do you find this replacement of species along this sort of metal ion gradient, or these metal gradients? Huh? Yeah. The idea would be probably some of these yarrow, buck, brush, fireweed, knotweed have some sort of adaptations, right, to be able to deal with, for most plants, these are fairly toxic chemicals, right? They're toxic ions. So they're able to either, I don't know how they do it, they either sequester them or they, you know, get them out of their systems and they're able to, you know, be able to, you know, live in those kinds of environments. So they probably have, each one of these probably have unique adaptations to deal with these fairly toxic metal ions, ion, toxic metals, okay? So this would be kind of an example of a pretty closed community and the understanding of what, what, what's actually driving it are these kind of these weird metals. There we are, okay. So now the next, Part of the lecture is going to focus on sort of looking at, again, top-down control or influence on community diversity, okay, or what we call bottom-up. So it's kind of like the snowshoe hair links example, right, where we're looking at how plant resources can influence these, what we call trophic levels above them, right, whether it's a herbivore that's eating it and then the predators that are eating the herbivore. The question in community ecology is what's the thing that's driving the diversity? Is it the top-down control, which is high-level high level predators are influencing the community structure, community diversity, or is it bottom-up? Okay, so here, the, obviously, there are easy, they're fairly simple way, simple experimental ways to do this. So here's the predator. Um, Oh, I should have looked, oh, okay, now I know, I can read. It's a predatory newt, okay? So here's the predator, okay? 
These things live primarily in ponds, lakes, and things like this. They're very widely distributed across North America. So these predatory newts are fairly common. And what we're looking at is sort of the relative weight at metamorphosis and the survival to metamorphosis of these three species. One, again, you don't have to remember all this, Scaphiophus, Hyla, and Bufo. These are basically amphibians, frogs, and toads, okay? And obviously, these things, frogs, lay their eggs in water, right? The larvae develop in water, and then they metamorphose and become adults in terrestrial environments and those sorts of things. But what they're looking at, these are aquatic predatory newts. And what happens to these larval, the, the sort of survival to metamorphosis or the relative weights of these three amphibian species in the presence or absence of newts. And also looking at the, the number of predatory newts per pond. So they did all these experimental ponds, and so they put two newt, no newts in some, two in some, four, and eight. So this is a higher density of predatory newts in the pond. Okay? So here are the key things. We can look at both of these. Here's the relative weight at metamorphosis. When there are a bunch of predatory newts around, is there any difference in the weights of these three species? Or do they all kind of look the same? Yep. They all kind of look the same. Okay? What happens when you go when there are no predatory newts around? If you're in a pond that has no predatory newts, what happens? Ah, these two do kind of well, right? In terms of their sort of weight. What happens to Hyla? It's kind of, they're kind of small, okay? They don't do so well when there are no newts around, okay? Now let's go down to here. Here's the survival to metamorphosis. Obviously, newts eat, thing, eat these things, right? But when you look at this, when there are lots of newts around, which species had the highest survivorship to metamorphosis, which means they're going to move out of that pond into the terrestrial environment? The hyla. It's still pretty low, right? Don't get me wrong. You've got pretty high predation rates, but this one did pretty well. What happens when you have no predatory newts? We're going to ignore, we're, we'll pretty much ignore all these other things. What happens when there are no predatory newts? Yep. Hyla does extremely poorly, right? And basically doesn't survive at all. And you can see they, they're not very big when they metamorphose and not many of them survive, okay? And it turns out Scaphiophis does the best when there are no predators around, okay? So here's, so let's think about what's, go, what's going on here. Here's the survival, we're just gonna primarily focus on this part. What do you think's going on here? Where do you get the maximum diversity of uh, amphibian tadpoles? Under what condition? Yeah. So you get the highest diversity when predatory newts are present. The hyla doesn't do great, but it do, you know it doesn't go literally to extinction. This one pretty much is probably going to go extinct. Whereas in the absence of predation, hyla pretty much doesn't do very well, and scaphiophis does the best. Okay. So here's this. Does this seem kind of weird? What's happening when a predator is present in terms of the species diversity of the things right below it in the trophic food chain? That's gr that is exactly right. So what's ha so the question is what's happening here, right? So w there's no predator here. What do you think is driving the hyla to such low numbers? It's not a predator. Yep, it's Scaphiophis. Guess which one is the better competitor? Scaphiophis. So what's happening here in the absence of predation? competition between these species is driving which one wins and Scaphiophis beats is a much better competitor and outcompetes Hyla and drives basically they don't grow very much and they die at a really high rate because that Scaphiophis is a much better competitor okay 
So this is kind of, a, w the reason I think this is an interesting study, or at least important, is there's an interaction between competition and predation that's occurring here that influences it. Whereas here, what do you think's going on? Why is um, Hyla going, having, you know, it survives to a pretty decent, much higher than the other two. Why do you think that is? What do you, th what, what do you think's going on? Yep, guess, guess who these guys prefer to eat? Yeah, they really, they really throw a strong preference for Scaphiophis mostly and Bufo. They really don't like hylids. They like, they'll eat them, but their prefer, the predator's preferred food are those two species, okay? So what happens here when there's a predatory, the key, here's the take home message. The key take home message is in the presence of predation, is competition between the species minimized? Yeah, because you're reducing these competitors to really, that newt is reducing those, those scaphiophis to really low levels so that the, it's not competing with the other two species as much for food, okay? So what's, this is, the key take home message is these predators reduce the density of the superior competitor and that kind of allows the other species to persist. So predation actually is a positive force for maintaining species diversity. In the absence of predation, you get much less species diversity. And this is actually a fair, this is a very common phenomenon in nature. Here's another example of it. It's real easy to create experimental plots in grasslands, right? Mow this thing, right? Here's a patch, here's a patch, here's a patch, here's a patch, okay? And they did a bunch of experimental treatments. There's a beetle, and the beetles are herbivorous herbivores that eat plants. This particular one liked one particular, it had a strong preference for one kind of particular plant in this grassland community in the Midwest. So here, here's an experiment where they eliminated the chrysomelid beetle from the plot. How do you think they did that? <laughs> yep, they did, they, they sprayed it with insecticides that were unique to these chrysomelids. Okay, so this is the plot where they reduced or eliminated what's called the keystone species, and I'll come back to what I mean by that. But this chrysomelid beetle is what we call one of the key species in this community that drive the diversity of plants in, the, in this community, this grassland community. So here is when the chrysomelid was eliminated. Over here, no insecticide and the chrysomelids are doing well. What happened? It's kind of the same thing. Predation influences competition, right? Who's the best competitor in this system, do you think, in the absence of predation? These things right in here, these are called goldenrods. So what you can see, what is really dense in these plots where the chrysomella beetle was eliminated? These golden, these, these orangish plants, these golden rods. You see them here every once in a while, but at much lower density, okay? So it turns out the chrysomelids really like these things. These beetles will, they tend to prefer these instead of the grasses and other sorts of things that live in here. And so what's happening is, and it's, again, it's kind of like just the previous example. This particular species, the beetle, is driving this, who's, who do you think is the best competitor? in the absence of being eaten by an herbivore. The goldenrod. They're real, I mean, they grow like crazy, they do runners, they take, they monopolize the space. They're, these are the best competitors. So in the absence of a chrysomelid beater, the superior competitor wins. So it's kind of a similar theme, but when a herbivore is present, it eats these, and more species can survive. So you have much higher species diversity where this chrysomelid beetle is, and this is, called, this is what's called a keystone species. That species seems to be the thing that's driving 
the species diversity to higher levels having a thing that eats this better competitor opens up space and survivorship for these inferior competitors and this is this is common in all sorts of communities so predation or beverage is not always a bad thing depending on what you okay let's talk about um, some other kind of cool things that and kind of deal with sort of top, how top level predators influence plant diversity okay I think this is Wales or Iceland I can't isn't that where it, no I'm not sure where it is somewhere in the North Atlantic so top level predators can influence plant diversity in a kind of an unusual way. Obviously, foxes don't eat plants, do they? They like to eat other things, right? And what they like to eat are seabirds, and especially nestlings or eggs and all sorts of things of seabirds. So seabirds nest in a lot of places. So let's look at, this is an area where, for whatever reason, I don't know if they did this experimentally, the top level predators or foxes were absent, okay? And this is what the plant community looks like. Here's where the top level predators, the foxes, are present, and that's what the plant community looks like. Do those look different? Okay, yeah. And here's what basically what happens here is when foxes are absent, guess what the density of seabirds nesting or living in that area is? It's much higher, right? And why do you think they're more fertile soils? because the seabirds are crapping onto the soil, right? So, okay. So they're producing, you know, they're excreting a lot of waste and things like that that plants can use and all sorts of things. So, so when the top level fox predators as foxes are absent, there are more seabirds, more fertile soils, and you get these large gr grasses, much higher pr what's called primary productivity. The amount of biomass of the plant community is much, much higher, right? Whereas when they're present, there are fewer, seer, less fertile soils and these kind of low-lying shrubs and lichens. And this, these, are, these are fairly nutrient-poor soils, right? Because there are fewer seabirds and those sorts of things, okay? So obviously, the key take home message for all three of these things is top-level predators or herbivores has this kind of cascading effect on the communities and the presence or absence of top level predators has a big effect on community structure and community diversity and the kinds of plants and animals that you see in any kind of community. Okay. Another, oh, we're gonna, we can't finish early, can we? No? I can ad lib for a long time. Okay. Okay. So another thing, so mo what we've been talking about so far right now is sort of biotic influences, that is predators influencing the community diversity below it, right? And this is what we call biotic interactions and those sorts of things. But a lot of times what happens in communities, there are lots of environmental or abiotic things that occur, okay? And especially in marine intertidal areas, you can have a lot of wave action. Some, some places have a lot more wave action than others. Some have shell, some have, sort of shorelines are more sheltered and all sorts of things. So these physical forces can differ depending on where you are. And this is a study that basically looked at what's called ice scouring. So this is in pretty cold areas. So there were lots of places where these things, certain sorts of places had lots of ice on them. Other habitats didn't have so much and we don't, I'm probably not gonna go into all the details, but so. And this occurs, this literally, is you can go to a shoreline. This was done in Maine, and at the top of this rocky outcrop, and it kind of goes to, an, it's kind of a rounded thing. And on one side is a south exposure. It's kind of facing, you know, south. On the other side is what's called the northern exposure, okay? This is literally over five to 10 meters from one part of the shoreline to the other side, okay? So here's, what you find in terms of on a northern exposure on a shoreline. All we're looking at, and don't, you don't have to worry about all these different patch areas and all that sort of stuff. Which one dominates the community on the northern exposure? Here's the area covered by each species. Just, these are all, these are the, the, the kind of similar 
semibilanus, the barnacles again, and this is uh, a brown algae. Which one dominates in the northern exposure? And this is over time from, they started the experiment in 1998, ran it four years. Which one dominated the northern exposure? The brown algae, okay? You go to the southern exposure, literally just over the hump of the shoreline, what do you get? Just the opposite. No brown algae in all of the barnacles. So it's just a blanket of barnacles on the southern exposure and a blanket of brown algae on the northern exposure. Which one do you think had a lot of ice on it? And one couldn't survive very well with a lot of ice on it or got scoured. That might be a hard one, huh? Yeah. The idea here is this one probably had very little ice scouring. Again, it's northern. It, it's not that, it's not like it's icy cold, you know, like, no, it's just this side of the northern exposure actually didn't have a whole lot of ice scouring, okay? And so it didn't, the scouring didn't dislodge the plant. The plants can't attach themselves as well to the rock or the brown algae can't attach themselves as well to the rock. So they did much better, okay? Because they weren't, the ice wasn't scouring them and displacing them. Whereas this one, which one do you, this one had a lot of ice scouring, a lot of ice moving and hitting it and knocking it off. And these, these brown algae could never get attached and couldn't live there. Whereas these barnacles can attach really firmly to the rock and even the ice scouring couldn't dislodge them, okay? So this is just kind of an example of a physical process that can influence which species you find, okay? Not just, not necessarily a predator or a prey. So two more slides. So, and again, this kind of goes back to the plant, hair, links example, you know, the sort of bottom up or top down control of things. And we'll just look at kind of, we're not gonna spend too much time on this, but here's the basic idea in communities. This is kind of the lower part of a food chain or a food web. We call these the producers, often primary producers, plants, kelp, algae, depending on where you are, right? And this is a primary consumer. These could be things that are eating plants, herbivores that are eating plants, and then these are gonna be secondary consumers. These are the things eating the primary consumer. And so this is called a trophic, this is called a food chain. And these are, the ver these are what are called trophic levels within a food chain or a food system. So this is the lowest level, the producer primary consumer, secondary consumer, and then this, this is the high level. And we're not gonna spend too much time on that, so, okay? So what we're, we're talking about here is two different approaches to how the diversity occurs at each of these trophic levels. So this is the base of the kind of food web, primary producers, next higher up, primary consumer, we'll show you an example of this, and then secondary consumers. Here are the two, ways we often think about it. One is what's called bottom-up control. So this says what's primarily influencing the sort of diversity above it is what's happening at the bottom. So the bottom is controlling the upper patterns of diversity, okay? So the idea here is with bottom-up control, increased production re results in greater productivity at all, at all higher trophic levels. So here you have, obviously, I'm not gonna go into all the details, but obviously you have a high, high numbers of producers, then these are the primary consumers, and there's this sort of linear relationship, right? Where highest, next highest, and lowest, right? And a lot of this has to do with loss of energy as you go up a food chain, right? that you lose energy, and we're not gonna spend too much time on this, but with bottom-up control, increased production results in greater productivity at all of the higher trophic levels. So these are what we call trophic levels. This is the lowest trophic level, intermediate, secondary, and tertiary, okay? So here you see this sort of, this is high, that goes, um, and then this is the lowest, okay. Top-down control is very different. So this is gonna be a predator, right? We're gonna ignore this part. 
with top to gown control, consumers depress the trophic level on which they feed, right? And this is, think back to the fox example, right? Are they reducing the number of birds, seabirds in the area? Yeah. So this, the, the fox example and a lot of the other things we talked, primary examples of sort of top-down control. So with top-down control, consumers, the secondary, high, this is the highest part of the food chain. Top-down control, consumers depress the trophic level on which they feed, right? So this one eats a lot of these and reduces this number relative to the bottom-up control. What's the effect on the thing below? It actually increases the next lower trophic level. And why is that? Huh? Yeah. So here, this top level predator, right, is reducing the density of the primary consumer that's eating the producer. So it's having less, less of that, if this is a plant or something, less of it is being eating, eaten by its primary consumer because this high level predator is reducing the density of that herbivore. Okay? So, <laughs> With top-down control, consumers depress the trophic level when they feed, increasing, in, indirectly increasing the next trophic level. So you don't see this sort of linear arrangement. Instead, you see sort of de decreased levels results in a much higher producer level. Okay, what's the evidence for this? There's a lot of evidence. Let me ask you a question. Which do you think is the most common thing in nature? That's hard to say. What do you think? What intuitively do you think is more likely top down. top down yep and that's what very few cases of sort of bottom up control have really there's some level of bottom up control but the primary thing is this model is the one that's probably has the most support and let me just give you a quick example of that and there are lots of these so this was done in sort of a freshwater um, lake ecosystem. And we're just going to zooplankton and phytoplankton. Phytoplankton are the um, primary producer level. These are algae and things that are floating in the water. They're photosynthesis. They're kind of like plants, you know. So here's photoplankton biomass along here. And zooplankton are eating those phytoplankton, right? And these are daphnia, all sorts of zooplankton. That, swim through the water column and eat phytoplankton and they're, they're consumers, okay? So in this system, what we're looking at right now is just the producer and the primary consumer, phytoplankton, zooplankton. When just those two things are in the system, what do you find? And these were a bunch of experiments that were done, so this is from these great, these are on a log scale from point one micrograms of chlorophyll up to 1,000. So this is much higher level. So it's a gradient in phytoplankton bi biomass. These are much greener. These are pretty depauperate environments, not much phytoplankton. How did zooplankton biomass respond in general to higher levels of phytoplankton? They went up, right? It's kind of, it's not, it's kind of messy. But here are all the experiments that they did. You put them in cups, and it's easy to follow these things. And then you look at the zooplankton abundance over about a five-day period. And so what you find is kind of this positive linear trend. So that at low phytoplankton biomass, there's a lower biomass of the primary consumer. But as you have higher levels of phytoplankton biomass, higher levels of zooplankton. So kind of a, lin you know, so phytoplankton is directly linked to higher levels of zooplankton in the primary consumer, okay? So do we have, is that the complete food chain in that system, do you think? Or is that just uh, an artificial thing? Well, it turns out, no. Something eats those zooplankton, so now, what, do you, what happens when you put the secondary consumer in there? Right, and these are going to be the fish. So now we've got fish that specialize on eating zooplankton, and what's the consequence? What do you think the guess what the result was? It was top down. The, the basic idea is pretty easy, simple top down control. The present, so they did an experiment where predators, the fish predators were present, and the fish predators were absent, and these are kind of, you kind of look at, these are kind of each replicate experiments. 
So here's the zooplankton abundance and phytoplankton abundance as a function of whether a fish was, fish was present in the experiment or not. So in general, it's pretty clear. Let's just look at this one. Here's the, here's the, here's, and we're not gonna go into all the details, but in general, let's look at what happened here. Here's where the fish is absent, okay? What happened? We still had a pretty high level of the zooplankton, right? They aren't being predated upon, okay? Now here's the line to a re the sort of controlled replicate experiment where they put a fish in there. What happened? Yep. So what you find is what happens here is the zooplankton went down a dramatic amount, right, from a thousand to a hundred. What happened to phytoplankton abundance? It went up from almost about tenfold the same response, okay? That's the most dramatic example. But here what you can see is when fish are present, they depress the number of zooplankton, the response was phytoplankton weren't being eaten and their density and abundance went up. So what this basically says, when, zo when fish were added, zooplankton decreased and phytoplankton increased, indicating top-down control. So when you have the entire kind of complement of the, eco of the community there, top-down control really influences the diversity of the primary producer and the primary consumer, okay? Ta-da, that's it. Any questions about that? Does that, that make sense? Okay. Want to do an eye clicker? Okay. Let's just do an eye clicker and then, um, and just a reminder, if you came in late on Tuesday, come. If you have, and if you've done it, that's fine. What I'd like to do is spend some time, we'll do a review session. The review, the, um, the study guide is on Moodle. So we'll spend the first, however long you want uh, on a review session. Huh? Uh, do, do, I don't wanna do it. Let me give you, let me give you some more examples. Let me give you some examples to do and I'll wait, a, I'll post the answers on Moodle don't look at them while you're doing the problems. Okay, so I, I, I don't think I want to grade. I don't, I'm not sure I want to grade anymore. I've got some, I've got the homeworks here, if you, the previous ones. Okay, so I think I'll just post some three, three problems to do and then I'll post the answers, but so you can do, okay. Okay, so we'll do a review session then. Um, we'll try to do the class evaluations and I'm trying to find, you should be getting, a, an email to you about a Google form evaluation for the lab that's separate. The pro anyway, I'm not gonna go into all the details, but the thing that you do on WebStar is the evaluation of me as the instructor of the lecture part. So, and then we're gonna be giving another example to evaluate the labs, okay? Because the problem is we, yeah. The, the last lab, the homework, yeah, I've got them here. So I can hand them out after, I can, I'll just hand them out after, once we do the eye clicker, okay. So I'll try to get some details about the evaluation. So we'll try to do those at, um, at once we're done with the review. Okay, let's just do an eye clicker for attendance again. I kind of burned out on questions. Okay. And I have to hand, I, I have these sorted, let me just. I can't, I can't have somebody hand them out because the grades are on them, so. So, <laughs> here's, ah, let me just get started. I'll just, 
Amini Ahmad, uh, Brianna Anderson, Ashley Burkell, Ashley Burkell, um, Katie Allemand, I think I posted the answers, but I'll check. Uh, Huang Bui, B-U-I, I probably messed that up. Michelle Campo. Christopher Castillo, is that you? Christopher Castillo. Kevin uh, De Barbieris, Olivia Dijon, Sophie Di Loretto, Madeline DePew, uh, Evans, I didn't. E V A N S? No. Nope. I didn't. There's only one Evans in the class. <laughs> um, Diana Frazier. Peyton Ginzel. Uh, Dorian Green. Adil Hamad, uh, Alex Howley, Ashley Huang, H O A N G, Hannah Hopf, H O P F, uh, uh, Chelsea. H U Y N H Hoon, is that probably got butchered that completely? Um, Candace Lassier, Chris Lyons, Megan Johns, Stacy Labitt. Uh, Montana Lapari, Daniel McGowan, Astrid Martinez, um, Muad Ismail, uh, Timmy Wynn. Uh, Sapna Naran, Ashley Wynn, Saja Atala, Otala, Brie Olivier, June Park. Maria Parks, Jared Perot, Peralt, Joy Shaw, there you go. Daniel Russo, Justin Smith. Uh, 
Samantha Schwartz, Jasmine Stevenson, Julia Stewart, uh, Ashley Seaman, Jonathan Selva, Chris Spires, um, Jennifer Tran, Michelle Tran, Suong Catherine Tran, Michelle, and Truck Tran. Uh, Anna Valadaris, Daris, Natalie Walker, Sierra Weathers, Joyce Vu, Feluke, is that you? Okay. Natalie, uh, Natalie Wong. Okay. Okay. Uh, I have my orders. So oh, right. Did you, you want me to copy something from the supervisor? I would send it to the client. Or you, if you just have your or, you have your orders. So, yeah, just send them to me, and I'll just yeah, just email, just send it to me, and I'll I'll, ex, I'll just excuse you from the yeah. Okay. <laughs> 